let's get these questions answered. So I answered quite a few of them. Um, just kind of why you were talking there. So if somebody has another one, go ahead and put it in the chat or in the question and answer. But I see Denise has a question. Is it what is the percentage of payroll for non-producers? And the average percentage of payroll for non-producers was 11%. So you are correct. Um, the other thing that uh, was 11% was the percentage of payroll taxes for non-pursuit, not, or excuse me, for producers. So there was two things that were 11%. Yes, okay, that's where I got confused too, because you shared both of those and I wrote it down. So mm -hmm. thanks Denise for asking that question. That does make a lot of sense. Um, I have a question then. Oh, here's another question that came through. Uh, your time formula, you had a great act. Oh, okay, great. So Susan, it's T-M-E-R, time, money, energy, and resources. So I don't take on any projects unless I can answer the questions. Do I have the time? Do I have the money? Because sometimes it's going to cost you money and sometimes that money is outside of time. Okay, you might have to buy a program, you might have to make an investment into something, you might have to have, you know, somebody on your team take on more, um, you know, or hire somebody to do that. Hire outside resources uh, to be able to do that. So time, money, energy, how much energy is this going to take? Do I have the bandwidth to be able to do that right now? And then, of course, resources. Is there somebody else that can help me to do this so I'm not maybe taking all of the time away from what I'm currently doing um, in regards to that? So thanks for asking that question as well. And then, all right, Michael, how do you suggest we compete with Swedes? All of the people that have left us mentioned that they want to... <laughs> They want to keep more revenues they are bringing in and also working less hours. Great. April, I'm going to let you take that one on first. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining us today. So I love this question um, because I, I think that when people leave um, an employee-based salon, uh, this is the number one reason that they leave, is they think that it is like a cash cow out there being on your own. And I think it's a catch-22. You as an employee-based salon, and I assume you are, Michael, since you're talking about this, um, you could educate them about all the expenses that they're going to have being their own business owner. Um, you could do that while they're working for you. Um, and I know that that could set them up for success leaving the salon, but it also might mean that they stay because they realize how much work it is to be a business person. Because I think, unfortunately, what happens, and Bonnie kind of alluded to this earlier, is that people leave employee-based salons with unrealistic expectations, and they don't understand how, how hard it is to own a business. So those of you on the call that own a business, you know how much work it is. And I know Bonnie does because she, um, she also is in that role. But it's not all roses once you get out there. Um, I think what's very unfortunate, Michael, in the sweet world is that a lot of people are not reporting all of their revenue. And so they're keeping more in their pocket, but not in a legal way. Um, you know, you have to report all of your service revenue, whether it's mm -hmm. cash or it's credit card. Um, and I think, unfortunately, what's happening is that sometimes um, in those uh, sweet rentals or even a booth rental, um, that's happening where they're not reporting all of their revenue. And so they run into a situation where now, if you guys, um, you're probably all aware of this, this 1099K change that's happened. Uh, of course, Congress is still uh, reviewing it. They pulled back on it in December of last year. Uh, there's actually some things going on in Congress right now about it again. Um, but uh, a lot of times those suite renters, booth renters are getting paid through Venmo or a cash app or something. And the IRS recognizes this, and that's why they made a change in how they're requiring those cash apps to report income. Um, and so I think we're going to see more of that. I think mm -hmm. what we're going to see is that the IRS is going to keep saying matching documents, matching documents, and we're going to have a problem. I We have a newsletter that's going to be coming out on that topic, and I also just recently wrote an article about it for the PBA. So if you're not a member of the Professional Beauty Association, I would encourage you to do that, to learn about that, what's going on with the 1099K. Um, and I could talk about this topic forever, but Bonnie, I should let you talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's perfect. I appreciate that. And so from a perspective, Michael, as um, a salon director, um, 
our last eight people that we've hired, two of them were in suites, two of them moved here from out of state, okay, so they came in from another state and then got licensed in Georgia. Um, two of them were salon owners that, that just finally, you know, threw the towel up in the air and said, I don't want to keep doing this, but I still want to be doing hair. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, two of them just kind of came from uh, other areas as well and um, kind of got nurtured into it. In other words, they weren't doing hair that long, um, tried to do the sweet thing, didn't have success, and then came to work for us. So again, it's, it's really, what, what do you think that your salon offers that no matter who it is, whether it's an assistant, whether it's um, somebody coming right out of school, whether it's somebody that already is licensed or is maybe, you know, been in the industry for a while, what is it that's making your salon unique? And, you know, why would they want to come work for you? And I can tell you that the ones that were booth rental that just finally, you know, and they have reasons why. So when I said, well, you know, why are you choosing this? And they said, because I have a three-year-old daughter and she's getting ready to go into school and I want to be more available to her. So I, you know, I, I, I don't want my client because I don't know how to say no to a client when they call me or text me and want in, I'm saying, yes, 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 yes. And I'm not disciplined or structured enough to be able to have a set schedule. So I want to set schedule that I can come in, not have to do all this other stuff, uh, you're buying products, accepting tech messages 24 seven, making appointments, you know, doing all that. I want to come in, do my work. And I want to then be able to go home and be with my family. So if you get to their why a little bit more, or you promote or campaign some of those whys, you'll realize you'll start attracting the people to want to come and work for you as well. That's a great way to look at it to try to go for their why. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. That's great. It's I see so many times that people are running ads or doing things that are saying, Hey, we're hiring. And what they're doing is they're talking about themselves, the salon. Yeah. Talk about who you're attracting, Mm -hmm. make it about them, switch that up and make it about them. The same with a client campaign. Okay. Stop talking about you start talking about them and you'll see a difference in response. Uh, you, you've made me think of something that Copsa Odi does here every year. Um, they have us fill out a questionnaire. There's eight items on that list, and we list them in priority. And it's what's important to us. And it's, it includes pay, but it includes, you know, flexibility. And are, am I challenged at work? You know, get to know the people that work there for you by doing something like that. And then use that to figure out, to go out there and advertise to bring people in. The people at Copes Odi say that they love to work there because family really is first, you know? So it's a, that's a great thing, Bonnie. Um, so Jeff Lindley has a question. Thank you, Jeff, for your question about tax credits. Uh, there has not been a change yet on the tip tax credit in the beauty industry. The PBA, um, as well as many other industry um, advisory folks continue to lobby for that, but it's not happened. If you don't know what Jeff's asking about, um, in the restaurant industry, there is a tip tax credit that can be taken on the tax return um, that actually gets back the the FICA taxes that you pay on your employees. Um, That is not available in the beauty industry. It's something that's been getting worked on for decades. decades. um, And it's not ever, it's not ever gone through. I'd say it's closer now than it probably ever has been. Um, but it, it has not gone through yet. So there's the answer on that one. Um, and listen, Jeff, if that does ever go through, we're going to be doing a big parade for mm-hmm. that to actually happen. But you can see why it hasn't gone through because instead of us coming together more as an industry and having uh, more dollars on our side as bigger salon owners, we're becoming more fragmented by this independent and individual and sweet approach that people are less engaged in how that's um, impacting them. And it's interesting that that happens, Bonnie, because those suite runners and booth runners, they are typically sole proprietors, and that means that they're filing as a self-employed individual. Mm-hmm. So they have to pay both sides of that FICA tax. That's another selling point yeah. to somebody that tells you they want more freedom, they can make more money if they leave. Well, they just lost 7.65% of their pay by walking out the door because they now have to pay that. They pay both sides of it. 
So I think that's one thing that they forget. And self-employment tax is much different than being on a W-2. So um, if we have any suite renters or booth renters on the phone, um, that's not our ideal client, but we do encourage you to be on our info listing because we send information out all the time. And like Bonnie said, sometimes this, this um, industry is fragmented. I would agree with that. I think that a lot of times uh, salon owners, and when I say salon owners, I mean large employee-based salons. I mean small ones. I mean suite renters. I mean booth renters. You are all business owners. And sometimes you don't take yourself seriously enough. Yeah. This is an amazing industry. And if everybody could come together, that tax credit probably could get passed. But we're talking about who has the money, you know, who has the money to pay a lobbyist to make it happen. That's what it comes down to, because that's what happened when the restaurant industry got it. They had the money, they came together and they paid it. And that's why it happens. Um, I, there's another question out here uh, from Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for your question. It's great to, to see that you're on this uh, webinar, Andrew. I haven't talked to you or seen you for a long time. So it's welcome, welcome. I can't see you, but I know you can see me waving at you. Um, what are the other reasons behind, besides money that people leave? I think Bonnie talked a little bit about that already. You know, flexibility, maybe um, just maybe wanting to be in control of their own thing. Um, I, I think you can take every one of those reasons and you can turn it around to why it doesn't really work out that way. Um, but on the other hand, I think there really truly are people that do want to be their own business person. And one of the things that I've learned over my, I don't know, 30 years I've been working, um, is that the, the people that I love working for the most are the people that want what's best for me and they get in line with my goals. And so if I want to be a business person, and let's say I wanted to be a partner at a CPA firm, then my communicating it to the BART partners in this firm is the only way I'm going to get there. And so I would challenge you to say to those people that want to be a business owner, how can we give you different roles at the salon so that you can feel that level of management, that you can feel that level of challenge, but you don't have to walk out the door. So let's get you into a management training program. Let's do some of these things. Let's figure out what traits you have that I can use um, so that we can feed that want for each person, because that's the people that are going to stay. Yeah. And I think, I think culture plays a big role in that people yes. are comfortable being, people are comfortable being in an environment that they feel nurtured in and, to, and taken care of. So, you know, if you are an owner that's behind the chair and you're not providing that leadership and that support, that nurturing support to your team on a regular and ongoing basis, it, it could definitely be a reason why people think I can do this myself mm -hmm. and I'm, what am I getting out of this? I can do this myself. So, you know, you have to, you have to balance that out at some point. Do you want to build a business and nurture people and be able to be profitable off of more, you know, more people working for you than you definitely doing a majority of the business behind the chair and having to always carry a portion of that business based on yours, you know, start spreading it out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Susan's got some questions here. You want to go with those first? One of, what are some of the KPI, key KPIs to give your front desk team or team leaders to do on a regular basis to keep growth moving? Good question, Susan. Um, obviously, rebooking um, is probably our number one KPI for our front desk team is that, you know, they definitely ask every single time um, about booking that next appointment um, for that client, because we really want to see, um, you know, that client. We also just did a, an entire online campaign because we realized our online numbers were pathetic and listen, uh, you know, we're all booking things online. So if that's something that can be automated in 24 seven, then why were we not doing it? Why were we not putting a focus on it? So our second KPI is if that client says, oh, oh no, I'll call in. We hand them an online booking card with a QR code on it. And we say, well, you know what? Set up an account uh, and you can book online 24 seven at your convenience type of thing. And it's And we've now made that a secondary priority because I can't have my front desk so busy 
um, taking care of customers and answering phones. We want to kind of eliminate that both of those tasks because somebody's getting neglected. The phones are getting neglected if they're with a customer in front of them or the customer's getting neglected if they're on the phone. And neither one of those are nurturing our clients for the long term. So we're really, we're really big on growing our online business now, which we've done a fabulous job, which I'm happy to share that information with you too. All right, what's, Susan's got it. Oh, what's the second point? What are, what are some ideas for management growth for a team member and how do you compensate them to do benchmarks in it? Mm -hmm. Yes, you go for it and, and uh, go for both of those questions, April. Okay, so uh, Susan, again, thanks for all your great questions. Uh, answered a couple of those off to the side too. So thanks for bringing those into the audience today. Um, I, I think for both management and front desk, definitely the rebooking is important. But I, I also think, you know, you need to, if you have a marketing campaign, so if you, um, whether you've done that yourself, or you're working with somebody like Bonnie, or you want to work with somebody like Bonnie, you know, what, what are your goals, you know, and then let's walk backwards from that. So if your goal is, that you need to grow retail. Well, then maybe what we need to do is for our um, front desk and our management team, maybe one of the things that they need to do is as a client is checking out, they need to be asking the question, did your provider talk to you about all the products that they used on your hair today? And can I send you home with some of those? Things like that, you know, and you need to have a script. What does that script say? Um, set goals, you know, between, uh, I have a, actually have some clients in California that did, did this really cool competition. And it wasn't about how many, um, how many uh, retail products they could sell, but it was about how many times they actually educated their clients about the product. Because it, and it's a, it's a mental switch. So you're, you're tricking your mind to think that you're not being a salesperson. But what you're doing is you're educating the client on every single thing that you're putting on their hair and not asking them to buy it. But if you do the education right, they're going to want to buy it. And then at the end of it, that front desk person or the manager, whoever's up there at the front, they ask that question. Did your service provider tell you about all the products they used on your hair today? And can I send you home with them? Things like that. So you can create a competition um, for those types of things. And guys, retail is a better money maker than even the services. So, um, and, and you're saying, how is that possible? Well, you need to sit down with somebody and you need to go through the numbers to know how that works. But, you know, on retail, you're not paying a 40% commission. You might be paying a 10% commission. Um, so that, that helps you out in that regard. Um, I've also seen front desk and management competitions for other things, a shared bonus for just keeping things picked up, making sure rebooking is done, making sure if somebody cancels at that appointment gets filled, you know, how many cancellations did we have and how many of those did we get refilled? You know, things like that. So um, I think you need to think about your goal first. If you don't have that goal, you need to work with somebody to get that goal in place. Mm -hmm. And then walk backwards from that on how you're going to hold your team accountable for that. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, we are, I, I can tell you guys as, as a salon, we are not the best retailers, but here's, here's my philosophy that I still believe. I am never going to teach the stylist to sell. I am never going to get our front desk to mm -hmm. sell, but I can teach the client to buy. So what I do in my front reception area, how I message my clients um, for the salon, uh, what things I entice them with once they're inside the salon, like we do scratch cards, you know, just like Kohl's, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they hand me a scratch card and I'm, I got my coin. They even hand me a coin and I am super excited to be scratching that damn thing off and to be able to see how much money am I going to save today? Okay. That that's kind of that client incentive that I'm talking about. So maybe my front desk is not all of them are going to be like, you know, the, this brilliant script that April just said, but maybe my front desk can hand him a scratch card and say, Hey, we have special savings on all of our uh, home care and retail products today, scratch this. And you'll be able to see what your savings are. And then people are like, yeah, yeah. Now, whether they buy something or not, but I'm telling you, our retail increases by doing things like that. So think consumer-minded approaches mm -hmm. to that. But I do want to emphasize what April said. I script a lot of content for our team. I script 
content for our team. So if they're not good retailers, I'm scripting them. Yes. If they have expectations to say it, because I'm scripting it. Same with our front desk. Takes and you can, you can coach them on that script yep. and you can also evaluate them on that script. Yeah. You know, you can have a secret shopper or somebody find out if they're actually doing it. You know, it's, it's much easier, I think, to determine whether a service provider is providing a good service because you're going to have a client that's going to squeal about it if not, right? Now, I realize you have clients that squeal that it's not a, it's not a real, real problem. But if you have a consistent issue with a service provider, you're going to make note of that. But no client is going to tell you that your front desk didn't offer to pre-book they're not going to tell you that they didn't offer them the retail product that the service provider asked to them about. Those are things you're going to have to evaluate your people on. Yeah. So and, you have to have a way of doing that. And looking at your salon, like, like April said, multi-revenue opportunities. So I know that our retail space in the front has to be able to absorb the space that it's taking with the retail product on the shelves. So I have to create a buying environment for clients when they're in there, when they're waiting for their appointment. And then we do a lot of incentives, team-based incentives. We break our team into teams to be able to do competitions, to win gift cards, um, trips, you know, uh, educational trips. So we do things like that throughout the year to be able to keep them engaged and um, excited about um, selling more retail or selling upgrades, which is another thing. So we don't discount our services necessarily, but we do offer incentives on upgrades. Um, and then we will do percentage off on retail or gift with purchase on retail because we've got the margins to be able to work with like April just shared. So, oh, look, we have more questions, April. Um, yeah. Speaking of rebooking, what is your opinion of how far out to pre-book appointments? Um, I think that probably has a dependent, uh, you know, an answer that will depend on the stylist themselves. Um, but we have some stylists that if clients don't rebook with them, they're not getting in at all, period, because their, their, their productivity is at 100%. Um, we have some stylists that, you know, book one out. If I, if I look at myself as a client, I book two out to be able to get in with my hairdresser because she's that busy. So I book two appointments out each time I'm, I'm finishing up an appointment, I'm booking another one out. So I always have two on the books. Um, and then that, you know, kind of supports that out. So I, I have no problem. I, you know, somebody pre-booking out is money on the books. It guarantees my future. Um, and I would say that if you are re, if you're having to pre-book out two visits, so 12 weeks, right? So six weeks in between appointments, mm -hmm. probably, that yep. you probably need to praise your prices. Yeah. Because, and, and we do like, that's definitely, yeah. that's definitely is when we're that, when you have that high of a percentage of productivity going on, then yeah. You're raising your prices and we have a system set up that they will go into a price increase and it's a promotion. So then we post it on the mirror that, you know, hey, you know, your stylist is has just received a promotion effective, you know, August 15th. Uh, they will be um, and at that next level, there'll be a price increase and then yeah. they'll see what that is. So it, it's definitely but there is a place where where people you know, we have a couple stylists that they've capped out, um, but they're fine because they're happy working 28 hours a week, making over a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. They're happy. They don't, they're not looking to, you know, rid clients. They're not looking to be busier. Um, they have that work-life balance that they're aiming for. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. So, mm -hmm. um, hair base. Hi, welcome. Okay. What is a good percentage KPI for online booking? Well, that's a great question. And I can tell you, um, one of the things that we did, we, we had, we didn't even have our online booking open for new clients because our staff was like, well, no, they're going to book the wrong thing. And then there's going to be this. And, and they, and we, we allowed them to kind of like voice their concerns. And I said, nope, we're opening it up for new clients. We're just going to clean it up so we can do the best job we can of communicating effectively what is, um, what is, what has gone here. So we've done a year campaign on online booking. Uh, we increased our existing client bookings by 31%, but mind you, we do a lot of rebooking at the appointment. 
So 31% is still a large number considering that we do a lot of rebookings at the front desk before they walk out the door. Our new client bookings were 57%. In other words, 57% of our new clients booked online. So if you're not doing booking online or you don't have it open or you don't have this system set up for automated booking, you need, you need to get into that. You need to make this happen. I, I definitely can help you on that. Uh, uh, arena as well, because I've seen a tremendous difference with that. And I think April wants to add to this as well. Well, I was just going to say that I'm really glad that you have that number because I don't have that number. Um, I did hear at, I'm just going to say, I did hear it data driven last year, which is where I sourced this, like, wow, I wonder what our online booking is because there was a whole topic on online booking. And they had said that their online booking was uh, like 45 to 53%. Like that was an average. So when I went and looked at our numbers of online booking and I realized we were so far below that, I'm like, oh my God, this is embarrassing. Like that is a huge opportunity for us to take on and see if we can get new growth out of it. And in, you know, in less than one year, because we're at that one year mark now that we've been able to measure these results. Um, but in less than one year, we exceeded that with uh, new clients. Yeah, and that's part- awesome. Yeah. It's- so I think we should go to Rob's question. He has a, a question about the good, what is a good percentage for rebooking? Um I think you should be at 75 to 80% um, at minimum. I don't know if that's unrealistic. I think most of our clients are there, if not higher, for rebooking. Um, rebooking is where it's at. I, I mean, I just really think that it is. Bonnie, what do you see in this area? Um, I don't see it that high across the board. And here's why. Here's what comes up in regards to that, Rob. And this might be something that you're noticing too, that cancellations and no-shows have never been higher. And so our, it, it impacts our rebooking numbers. So our top stylists are sitting at 60 to 70%. Um, our mid-level stylists are kind of in that 40 to 50%. And then newer stylists are probably in that 30% range. Um, there's a tremendous amount of growth opportunity in there, but we, you know, no shows and rescheduling does impact that number from our percentages in there. So we look at productivity and rebooking so that we can kind of measure those two together. How productive were they? And then is rebooking increasing that productivity? I think uh, probably the reason why ours is a little bit higher is because we do have quite a few of our clients that charge a fee Mm -hmm. for a cancellation. Um, We're seeing more and more of that, that, you know, if you don't cancel, you're still paying part of the fee. So I, you know, I think that works in some areas of the country. It probably doesn't work in others, but um, we're seeing more of that. Nicole had a question or she had a response. It says, I book out for a year. I've just heard some negative comments. I would be curious, Nicole, if those are appointments are kept. If you book out that far, do they actually keep the appointments? Um, or if they don't. Now, I'm in a different industry than you in that I work in the accounting industry in the tax world. And we book out our client appointments for a year. Um, we, you know, you're going to be every two, the first Tuesday of every month you know, and that's what we do. And it works great for us. So I would be curious about, about that. And who are the negative comments coming from? Are they coming from clients or are they coming from your stylist or your uh, Uh, industry? I I bet, I bet they're coming from industry, Nicole. And you know what, Nicole, I wouldn't worry about that. If you're happy with your base clientele, your income, um, and your freedom and flexibility that, that you are managing at this point in your life, I wouldn't worry about it, but Mm -hmm. if you're trying to make more money and you're booking out that far, then it does reflect that you probably need to do a price increase. If you have a higher cancellation rate than normal because you're booking out so far and people are like, oh, I know I booked it, but now I got to go out of town and stuff like that, then, you know, maybe have some online booking as, as a backup and book two appointments out so that you can keep that flexibility of some of your books open because you know, if a new client's trying to get in and you're that and your your percentage of booked up is pretty high, 
then a new client is going to be like, oh, I couldn't get in with her. I'm just, I got to find somebody else. So you have to evaluate a few of those uh, areas um, based on, you know, your level of happiness in it. And uh, Andrew made a comment, uh, April and Bonnie, I recommend owners focus on the asks for rebooking the percentages or just the outcome. So again, just making sure you're coaching on that script, making sure Absolutely. you're holding your people accountable. You know, I've seen people build staff reviews on that being one of the things, you know, having a, having somebody um, judged on whether they are doing the ask, you know, That's eight out of 10 times is it happening? So it's, it's part of the script, Andrew. So I totally yeah. get that. Um, if they don't ask that client for the next appointment, we, we measure that from based on our front desk. We also, we also really engage the stylist to support us with that. So the stylist, we, on our mirrors, we have four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks on the mirror. So the stylist then writes on the ticket before it comes to the front, eight weeks, say, okay. The front desk now has the ticket in their hand and they're like, it looks like, uh, you know, Susan wants you back at, at 10 weeks. That would be, they go right to the computer at 10 weeks and they let them know what the date is. So the more information that comes to the front desk for that client, the, the more the client books the appointment. Because then she's like, oh, wow, yeah, because I've got a wedding in a couple of weeks. I need to get that booked. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of, it, all of it has to work together. And, and when you can get those systems in place it, between your providers, your front desk, and the scripting mm -hmm. of that, you're, you're golden. That consistency. Yeah. Um, let's read Susan's question here. Okay. Um, because I haven't had a chance to. Sorry, Susan. I hope I hope we didn't overlook you. Um, what is the method or formula you use for how much you can give them in, in an incentive? Mm -hmm. I recently used Chat GPT to figure out break even. Book five hundred dollars in a cold call rebook to earn twenty five dollar coffee card. It is easy to give um, too much for a job already done to keep it in that forty to thirty five percent range. Is um, I'm not sure I completely understand this, April. So maybe you do. Was that suggesting um, an incentive for the stylist or the client? That's what I think Susan's saying, but I don't, I'm not sure if she's saying. Yeah, any clarification? She's saying an incentive for the client. I don't know. So Susan, we need to know if that's an incentive for the employee or an incentive for the client. Yeah. And while Susan maybe is giving us a little bit more information on regards to any staff member, your extra game incentive. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we do incentives like that. Um, you know, each quarter there's something going on where people have the chance to do it. So, you know, obviously I, th I think you need to look at what the investment is. Um, I'm a big fan of asking our vendors for support when we do these promotional activities to help us offset additional things that we're doing for our team. So if, um, if I know that um, we want to offer incentives to our staff, we ask them for product, extra product. We also know that we can use points sometimes to buy gift cards. Um, so we have ways to be able to do that, but don't be afraid to ask your key manufacturers, your key people that are a part of your, that are there to support and help you grow and have a successful business. Do not be afraid to ask them for things in order to help offset your um, percentages in regards to that. I like your math here, Susan. I like that you're trying to keep that gross profit percentage between 40, 35 and 40%. Um, industry average is somewhere around 40%. Uh, we kind of keep our target there as well. Um, let me say that again. So industry average or benchmark is around that 40%. And COPSA OD uses that same as a target. So why am I saying there's a difference between a target gross profit percentage and a benchmark? There's a difference be because benchmarks what the industry is doing. Target is where do you want to be? Okay. So where do we want you to be? So if you are giving away a gift card in order to get sales booked, make sure you understand how that impacts your bottom line. 
I love that you're using the benchmark percentage, or excuse me, the gross profit percentage here. But also keep in mind that that coffee card that you give to your employee is considered payroll. Mm -hmm. So whether it's coffee or a Visa card or a uh, Amazon gift card, or maybe it's a free, uh, pick out a free bag from Amazon, something like that, that is payroll. So that coffee card for $25 really costs you about $27 when you consider the tax that's associated with it. And that's where I see a lot of salon owners get into a little bit of trouble is they don't realize that those incentives are taxable. I think sometimes people are trying to get around that by giving away gift cards or giving away TVs or giving away things. Yeah. According to the Department of Labor and the Federal Labor Standards Board, those things are considered wages. So you have to watch that. Yeah. And you're right, Susan, it is harder to ask more for vendors than it ever has been there. Everybody's got a tight budget, seems like it's going on right now with that. Um, hey, well, do you want to answer Rob's question? You guys, thanks for staying on with us and, and being so engaged. Yeah, this, this is, is great. Awesome. Um, so I know we're, we kind of had this plan to 415. We're, we're past that. So feel free. I mean, uh, April, are you good to stay on and keep answering? I think so. Let me check my calendar and make sure I don't have a client appointment that I'm going to run into. Because I'm going to say that you need to answer Rob's question. <laughs> I I have I have probably about 15 more minutes. Okay, good. Well, I think that's okay. So fine. Rob's question is: Do you suggest passing along three percent merchant fee, and if so, how? So, it in all honesty, I think it's tacky. I think telling a client they have to pay you for that processing is tacky. Um, I, I think that you are operating a, a business that it is, it is just part of the cost. So if you need to increase your fee in order to cover it, I think you just do that. And I think most people understand that those merchant fees are growing. So if you need to put a, po put a little note at the front desk that says our service prices have increased by, you know, $5.00 then to cover increasing costs. We all know it's happening. What's it cost you to go get gas in your car? What's it cost you to get a thing of milk? You know, everything is going up. But I think it's tacky to charge a merchant fee through yes. a client. Yeah. It's 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 part it's part of doing business. And listen, yep. if we didn't if I didn't have a credit card to pay for things, I wouldn't be buying things. And I look at my credit card sometimes as incentives because I'm getting mileage and points. And so, you know, I, I look at it as that's how I want to spend my money to be able to get more with everything. So um, any and there, there's a way uh, I'm sorry, Bonnie, can I just one more yeah, thing? No, of course. There's a way to pass on those costs and not have it impact the commission that you're paying to your people, too. So keep that in mind. And the law does vary state to state. So you'd want to talk to your attorney, your labor attorney about this, but you know, you can have an experience fee or a, um, some people just call it a service charge or an, an off the top deduction, you know, that comes off of the ticket that's not subject to commission. In most states it works. I'm caveating that because you do need to talk to somebody in your state, but usually what you can do is you could say, hey, we're gonna add, we're gonna add $5 to the ticket, but stylist that's because we have to pay this increasing charge for merchant fees we have to pay this increasing charge for utilities whatever you want to do whatever you call it whatever it is and then you take that off the top before you calculate their commission it's really important you do that right you have to communicate it correctly you have to make sure of course again like a labor attorney needs to talk to you about it you need to make sure that you don't calculate commission and then deduct that cost it has to come off the top so, um, but I, I would encourage you to consider that as well. That is an option. Yeah, perfect. Um, Jeff's question, any salons doing sign on bonuses for new stylists and what's your opinions? Mm -hmm. um, we, if, if there were some quality people out there that I believe would benefit from that, we probably would do it, but, um, you know, I look at, I look at it like people are kind of like a golden nugget. They just sometimes somehow just show up, um, and have heard about us. We had somebody come in that, that was recommended by us from two other salons. They didn't have any, they did not have the business to be able to bring on another stylist. In other words, just because they had an empty chair didn't mean they had a client demand for business. And so they recommended that particular stylist to us. 
um, to come over. So I, we haven't found that to be. However, we do do internal sign-on bonuses. So if a stylist knows a stylist and they get hired on, the stylist gets an incentive bonus for introducing us to that stylist. And I can, you know, again, you guys set up that one-on-one -on -one appointment with me, um, you know, um, and I'm happy to be able to do that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that slide too, just so you guys can see. I guess I don't have it. Hold on, I gotta go back. If you need that again, oh, whoops, I just passed it. Yeah, here. So, so we're not seeing very many um, sign-on bonuses for new stylists, but we are seeing a growing apprentice program mm -hmm. in states that allow it. Um, you know, some states like Arizona recently changed their law. So you can have a program in house and, you know, be able to do that so that um, there's kind of a, a contract per se. I don't know if that's the right language, but where you train them and maybe they pay a discounted amount for their almost like they're going to school, but they're not going to school. You're giving them the school yeah. and then they have to stay for so long. So there's that um, that we see. Um, yeah, and it looks like a couple of these other questions are for you, April, as well. Okay, so uh, hair base. Hair so base? Juan has a question. I'm wondering if that's Grace. I know a Grace from hair base. I don't know if that's Grace or not, um, but I've met, I've met Grace before. Um, when calculating the 42% wages, is that without tips? That is without tips. Um, does it include the FICA and state tax? No, it does not. So FICA, FICA is included in my um, producer payroll tax number, which is 11% of the producer's wages, but state and federal income tax would be separate because that's the employee's cost. That's not your cost um, at the salon. That's a deduction that you have to do, but it's not something that costs you any money. Um, let's see. Uh, to Rob's point, mega restaurants in Chicago are charging a service fee. I know it seems tacky, but it's become it's becoming a reality, and young people don't think twice. I don't disagree with you. It's a personal opinion that I have. Yeah. You know, you you have to decide what's best with your um, with your client base, um, and I'm sure that you'll be able to do that, and it'll work out fine for you. Um, and, and I think about it from a brand standpoint too, you know, if you have an already established clientele and a brand, and then all of a sudden you're asking, a, 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 you're creating a new policy that is going to impact all your clients, I promise you, you're going to lose clients. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're a newer business and you want to set up policies that support you in that arena, fine, go for it. But, you know, if we changed out some of these bigger policies and nickel and dimed our clients like that it would, it would impact our business negatively. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, go for it, April. I think there's another one here for you. Okay. Just a minute. I'm, let me, I'm trying to clear some of these out so I can see them. Um, oh, hi, Mitch. Great to see you on here today too. Um, I heard of the suggestion instead of charging the client, the processing fee to give them a discount for cash. Well, I'm going to say that's tacky too. Um, and here's why. I think if you say to somebody, pay me in cash and it's cheaper, they think that you're just not going to report the cash. Like they think you're trying to hide revenue. Um, now, maybe that's because I'm a CPA, but that's the impression I get from it. And also think about the cost that it had, that you have in the salon if you have to handle the cash. Now, all of a sudden, you have somebody at the front desk that you have to trust to handle all that cash. You have to be able to get it to the, get it into the, um, the bank. And of course, most clients, it's more convenient to use a card. So that would be my thoughts about giving a discount. I do see that. Sometimes I see that on gas pumps. Come inside and pay with cash and it's cheaper than if you pay at the pump with your card. But I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, hard to hard, hard to say on that. You know, it's I I don't like I don't I I don't want to discount anything in regard to the services because that is how we make a living is based on our services. I look at other revenue streams and opportunities of being able to create more incentives around it than discounts. Mm -hmm. Susan has a question about the service fee and where you put it on your chart of accounts. Uh, we do have clients that do show that as a client service fee, and that we have other clients that it's just part of the service fee. Um, it can mess up your key performance indicators if you keep it together with the service charge. Um, so you just have to think about how you are utilizing your financials to manage your business and how it's going to impact you that way. 
I don't think there's a right or wrong answer there. Yeah, perfect. Good. Okay. I think we got all the questions answered. You guys have been fantastic today. Thank you so much for giving us your time, your energy, um, allowing us to be your resource. <laughs> and uh, hopefully this converts into more money for you um, in your business and a better bottom line. So we thank you for being here today. And again, yeah. I'm going to uh, push this over here. This is how you can uh, reach uh, April and uh, the Copes Odi organization. And here's how you can reach me if you guys are interested in that. And again, I'm offering, you'll see an email follow up from us. Um, and then because I think this was a really informative webinar um, and we have it recorded that we'll also send you guys a copy of it if it's something that you want to share with your, uh, maybe your management teams um, to be able to hear some of the information as well. So thank you again, everybody, for being here. We appreciate thank you. you. Thank you for spending your Monday with us. I know you're busy. Have a great week. Win the day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>